Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Blakely Wellness Webinar, A Recipe for Success. We thank you for your interest in, in this topic and for joining us, especially under these extraordinary circumstances. My name is Arlene Boyce, and I have the honor of serving as Director of Development with Toronto Rehab Foundation, where we support the incredible work of Toronto, uh, of Toronto Rehab in providing leading edge rehabilitation, research and education. As a proud member of the University Health Network, our seven hospital sites support the recovery and return back to home for individuals affected by aging and conditions such as brain and spinal cord injury, heart disease, stroke, and more. But a key focus of our work is really around prevention and providing the strategies to maximize health and well-being. And to help with this effort, Toronto Rehab Foundation is proud to host this series of webinars led by experts in the community who share valuable health information and empower you with the tools to live a healthier life. So today, uh, delivered through Zoom, uh, we have well close to 400 viewers signed on, which is fantastic. Many of across Canada and with some international viewers from around the world, US and Brazil included. We also have our colleagues from University Health Network and other hospitals such as Lake Ridge Health, Mackenzie Health, SickKids, and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health joining us today. I'd like to take this moment, uh, because we have so many healthcare workers joining us, to really extend on behalf of myself, and I'm sure many of the viewers that are here today, to extend our incredible thank you. Um, we are so deeply grateful for the heroic and tireless efforts of our frontline health workers um, here and around the world, really helping to combat the COVID-19 um, crisis. With us, I'd also like to thank those essential service workers, including uh, Wellwise and Shoppers, uh, uh, who is our sponsor today, and Loblaws, who kindly made available to us uh, one of their talented uh, food experts to join us. Um, the work of these essential uh, services members really enable us to do our part to help flatten the curve and stay at home, keep safe and healthy. So before we begin uh, today's session, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors whose generosity has made these uh, wellness webinars available. And that is, um, I'm just clicking on to this, um, Lickrillin Capital, Raymond James, Wellwise presented by Shoppers Drug Mart, McLeish Orlando, Oatley Vigman Lawyers, 33.7, Bayer, and Scotiabank. Thank you for your wonderful support. So I'd just like to remind everyone as uh, with respect to this webinar is that it is interactive and towards the end of it, we will be having a Q&A, a question and answer period. And if you'd like to send in your questions, please do so at this address, trf at uhn.ca. And I repeat, that's trf at uhn.ca. And this address will also be located on the bottom of the slides as we move forward with the presentations. So today's topic, A Recipe for Success, is really designed to provide us with the tools to make healthy choices, including learning how to navigate through this increasingly complex landscape of food marketing and fad diets. Um, and, and to help us guide us through this session, including the Q&A, is Dr. Paul O. Oh. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. O. Oh. Dr. O oh is the Medical Director of the Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation Program at Toronto Rehab and the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. And he's also the Good Life Fitness Chair in Cardiovascular Rehabilitation. Welcome, Dr. O. Oh. Thank you very much, Arlene. It is indeed a pleasure to be able to join you this afternoon along with so many of our friends and colleagues online. Uh, we've had a lot of attention, obviously, to COVID and uh, its, its complications and prevention. And, and one of those really important aspects is that we do look after ourselves and our families and think about uh, important behavioral aspects like healthy eating. So we're delighted that you can join us for this important session in particular. The agenda for this afternoon or for the next hour will we'll cover these important topics. Uh, I will start off the discussion with just a little bit of background about why healthy eating matters in Canada and where are we in terms of a nation, in terms of uh, consumption at this point. Uh, 
uh, my colleagues uh, are, are much better informed in these areas and I, I'm, I'll, I will in introduce them in turn at their sections, but we are uh, very privileged to have Nilu and Carly with us today uh, as nutrition experts to touch on these topics of uh, a bit about COVID-19 and nutrition, uh, talking about why dietary patterns actually might make a difference to your long-term health and what does the evidence say, how this might all come together in the most recent version of Canada's food guide. And then when we operationalize that in home, what can we, uh, how can we bring in topics in nutrition uh, for the plates uh, that we serve to ourselves and our families? And as Arlene has introduced, that we will be uh, conducting a Q&A session through the end of this. So please do uh, fill in some questions uh, as we move through the, uh, the, the topics. And you'll notice in the bottom of your Zoom uh, control or at, sometimes at the top that there is a uh, Q&A uh, feature where you can uh, type in your questions uh, or um, you can, uh, as Arlene said, you can just email them into trf at uhn.ca. Okay. So setting some of the landscape, why uh, do topics like uh, eating matter? Well, we are all touched by uh, chronic diseases in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families. And certainly for those of us working in the healthcare landscape, uh, we see people on a regular basis living with chronic conditions. Uh, Public Health Agency of Canada would suggest that for adults over the age of 20, uh, as many as 44% of us live with one of 10 chronic common conditions. Uh, and as we get older, in fact, living with a chronic disease is the norm uh, as opposed to the exception. And, and the range of disorders uh, come from cardiovascular disease with heart disease and hypertension to metabolic bone conditions like osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, mental health conditions, uh, anxiety, depression uh, as examples, diabetes, uh, asthma, cancer, mental health conditions, all of this is going to be very, very important uh, in our lives. Uh, and it's important to think about ways that we might modify that. I, I did see one question pop up at the bottom uh, asking if, if this presentation will be made available. Indeed, it will. Stay tuned for um, information on where to find this later on. So we have lots of chronic conditions in our communities, in our lives. If we could actually think about one step back about the risk factors or the modifiable behaviors that impact upon chronic diseases, that might be a nice solution for us. And as we are spending time at home in this day and age, then we might think about some of the things that we can do on a daily basis. So we are aware that there are some non-modifiable traits that might influence whether we develop heart disease or cancer as diabetes as examples. So who's been in our family lineage, uh, how old are we, uh, biological sex and, and uh, social gender may play some roles here. But there are also many things that we can do in our daily lives that influence our health trajectories, including inactive lifestyles, whether we smoke or not, how much we drink, how we cope with the stresses in our lives is very, very important. And the topic for today that we want to highlight is the foods that we choose to put into our bodies and how unhealthy eating actually impacts on the development of chronic disease. Unhealthy eating has been associated with a range of those chronic conditions, including diabetes and cardiovascular diseases and cancer and brain health. And the thought is that up to 80% of premature deaths from heart disease and stroke can be prevented by two major health behaviors, eating well and being active. So it is indeed worthwhile paying attention to the nutrition part of the spectrum as ways towards health. Where are we in Canada? Well, statistics from the Public Health Agency of Canada, Heart and Stroke and Health Canada, uh, Health Canada surveys tell us that more than half of Canadians 12 years of age and older consume less than five fruits and vegetables per day. So we aren't getting enough fresh produce and that then leads to us not getting enough important nutrients like calcium and magnesium important for bone health, potassium that's involved in all kinds of systems in our body including how our muscles work and our heart beats properly, 
important vitamins for bone health like vitamin D and getting enough fiber that's important for uh, the health of our digestive system. So there are important immediate health effects. If, if, if we look at another snapshot of dietary patterns in Canada, you'll see in the green part of this pie chart, what's highlighted is about a third of us will spend, uh, or a third of our daily, uh, daily energy intake is, is spent around unprocessed or minimally processed foods. These are fresh fruits and vegetables, for instance. But the majority of what goes into us as, as a typical Canadian uh, are these things like ultra processed foods that have high sugar, high sodium, less nutrient value to them. And clearly there are strides that we should be thinking of and putting into play in our daily lives uh, in order to improve our health moving forward. To tell us more about these healthy eating patterns, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Nilu uh, Delami. Uh, Nilu is a registered dietitian and masters, and she holds a master's in public health. Uh, she has worked within the University Health Network as a dietitian in Toronto Western's outpatient dietitian clinic in our own cardiovascular disease prevention and rehab program, uh, and more recently returning back to the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. In addition to her hospital roles, Nilu has recently launched her own virtual private practice and nutrition consulting company. So she is very uh, busy and thoughtful about what Canada eats. Nilu, let's turn this over to you uh, to take us through the next part of this presentation. Thank you, Dr. O, uh, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you for all, uh, to all the viewers for uh, signing in and tuning into our webinar. Um, I understand it's a very stressful time uh, for any uh, for many of us so uh, I do appreciate that you've taken uh, some time uh, today to learn more about healthy eating and how it can prevent a lot of the chronic diseases uh, that Dr. O uh, mentioned. Now before I begin I just want to mention that the website that is listed um, on this uh, slide is correct but I am facing some technical difficulties but it should be up and running within a week or so. So as Dr. O mentioned, uh, in Canada, there is definitely room for improvement uh, for us to eat better. And of course, eating well has all those uh, benefits of reducing our risk for a range of chronic conditions. Uh, but one of the major barriers to eating well for many Canadians is that nutrition information can just be so confusing. Every day it seems like there's a new, sorry about that, uh, a new trend, a new superfood. Uh, even with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we find that there's all this information out there and it's hard to tell uh, what information is accurate, uh, what information is misleading. So my goal today is to uh, just walk you through some of the evidence uh, that there is out there. Uh, so first I'll start by just dispelling a few myths around uh, COVID-19 and nutrition. I'll briefly cover um, nutrition and immunity. Um, and then I'll walk you through four uh, dietary patterns that have uh, a lot of evidence behind them to show that they can reduce the risk of certain chronic diseases. And I'll just finish off with uh, just a brief overview of some of the trending uh, topics of nutrition that we've seen over the past uh, year or so. So now we'll do a little bit of uh, myth busting on COVID-19 and nutrition. And these are claims uh, that we see on uh, social media websites, on the internet, news articles. Uh, so I just wanted to address some of the more common ones. So the first is that drinking warm water regularly will protect me from getting the COVID-19 virus. And this is actually a myth. While there's nothing wrong with drinking warm water, whether it's on its own or with lemon or in the form of tea, uh, as is practiced in, in many cultures and can be quite soothing and hydrating uh, when you're ill, 
And warm water doesn't actually kill the COVID-19 virus. So the idea is by drinking warm water, you can kill the COVID-19 virus before it infects you. And there's actually no evidence to support that. The best way really to uh, protect yourself from the COVID-19 virus is to follow those guidelines around uh, hand washing and practicing physical distancing. The next statement is that I need to take immune boosting supplements and natural health products to protect myself from the COVID-19 virus. And this is also a myth. Uh, to date, we have no evidence that any specific uh, supplement, natural health product, uh, or even specific just one food will protect you from the COVID-19 uh, virus. And again, it comes back to just hand washing, cleaning surfaces, um, and physical distancing uh, that are really what you should be uh, focusing on uh, most. Our next statement is that eating a healthy and balanced diet, along with following other healthy habits, plays an important role in keeping our immune system strong. And this is absolutely true. So a lot of the nutrients um, in our food are essential in keeping our immune system functioning well. Um, and other healthy lifestyle habits, including exercising, uh, sleeping well, managing stress, not smoking and limiting alcohol, uh, can also play an important role, <coughs> excuse me, in keeping our immune system strong. Now, when it comes to nutrition and the immune system, there are a few vitamins and minerals uh, that are essential in keeping our immune system working. Uh, so we have vitamins A, C, E, and D, folate, selenium, and zinc. Uh, we need all of these for our immune system to work well. Uh, now, all of these we can get from our food, so uh, except for one of them. Um, so vitamin A we can get from uh, things like uh, dairy products, we can get beta carotene, which is then converted to um, vitamin A from uh, things like carrots and squash and all those orange uh, fruits and vegetables. Vitamin C, we can get from citrus fruits, we can get from kiwi, red and green uh, bell peppers, some leafy greens. Uh, vitamin E, we get from uh, things like nuts and seeds, avocado, uh, nut butters, uh, nut oils as well are excellent sources of vitamin E. Vitamin D is the one that we can get in small amounts from food. So we might find it in fatty fish, uh, we might find it uh, in egg yolks, and uh, we also have it in fortified uh, milk or soy beverages as well. Uh, but it doesn't really add up to the amount that you need when you get it from food. Uh, the other way we get it is from exposure when our skin is exposed to sunlight. Now, we are all staying at home, so we're not going to have much sun exposure. Uh, so the, it is recommended that you do take a vitamin D supplement, as many of us have been uh, taking them throughout the winter months. So just something to continue because it does play an important role uh, in immunity. Uh, folate, so you can get from your uh, dark leafy greens, you can get from avocado, uh, selenium, you can get from uh, Brazil nuts, pumpkin seeds, fish, uh, meats, and zinc. You can get again from uh, your nuts and seeds, you can get from fish, uh, oysters, and meat products as well. So as you see, with most of these, you can just get these nutrients by following uh, a healthy, balanced, and varied diet. So what is a healthy diet or uh, what is a healthy, I see a question here, how much vitamin D supplementation? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'll just address it now. Uh, the recommendation is between 800 to 2000 uh, units per day, depending on your, uh, your age. Uh, now, in terms of healthy dietary uh, patterns, uh, of course, I'll help you get all the nutrients that you need uh, to keep your immune system strong. Uh, but they can also, as Dr. O mentioned, prevent several uh, chronic diseases. So I'll walk you through four of the ones that have quite a bit of evidence uh, to support that they do uh, indeed reduce the risk of chronic diseases. 
I'll start off with the Mediterranean diet. Uh, this is quite popular. Uh, you have probably heard about it in the news, in the media, uh, and for good reason, uh, because there is a lot of evidence that it is uh, quite uh, good for us. So what the Mediterranean is, is it's a, a traditional eating pattern that's followed in uh, countries around the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, think Greece, Spain, Italy, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to uh, eat like you're Greek or eat like you're Italian to reap the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. It's actually quite adaptable uh, to different cultures. So it's primarily a plant-based diet. Uh, if you look at the base of the uh, pyramid, you see uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, uh, legumes, your beans, chickpeas, lentils, you have your whole grains, uh, you have olive oil as the main source of fat. Uh, if you move up, you'll see uh, fish and seafood is rec recommended around three times per week. Uh, now the emphasis is on fatty fish, uh, so think Things like salmon, uh, trout, uh, sardines are all excellent sources uh, of those fatty fish. Uh, poultry and dairy are recommended in moderation. And then meats and sweets, so that's your red meat and your sweets, are at the very top of the pyramid. So the diet is actually a very good source of fiber, healthy fats, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Uh, processed foods are limited, uh, and uh, so is red meat. Now, this diet can help lower the LDL or the bad cholesterol, it can help lower blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, and inflammation. And there have been many studies done on its relationship with uh, chronic diseases. Uh, so a few landmark studies that were done, one includes what uh, was called the PREDIMET trial, uh, where people who had no history of heart disease but might have been at higher risk uh, were either uh, given the Mediterranean diet or had uh, were on their on a regular control diet uh, and they were followed uh, for five years and at five years they found that uh, for those who followed the Mediterranean diet they had 30 percent lower risk of developing any sort of uh, heart disease or, or stroke. Um, another diet called, uh, uh, sorry, another study called the Leon Diet Heart Study uh, looked at people who already had uh, one heart attack uh, and they followed these patients, uh, uh, these, sorry, participants for two years. They were either on the a Mediterranean diet or a control diet, and they found that people who were following the Mediterranean diet had 50 to 70 percent less risk of having another event. So that is quite significant. Uh, studies also show that the Mediterranean diet helps with uh, diabetes prevention and management, as well as with uh, cognitive, it tends to prevent uh, or delay cognitive impairment and dementia as well. So if you're interested in seeing uh, how close your current eating pattern is to uh, the, di the Mediterranean diet, uh, I would recommend that you vi uh, visit cardiaccollege.ca. We have um, a Mediterranean diet score tool there where uh, you can fill out a questionnaire and it gives you a score out of 13. Um, and uh, based on your score, you can get practical tips on how to get your uh, diet to be closer to the Mediterranean eating pattern. So the next diet I'll go through is the DASH diet. So DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Hi uh, Stopping Hypertension. Uh, so it's actually a diet that's used, it's a therapeutic diet that's prescribed uh, by dietitians and physicians to help in lowering uh, blood pressure. It's mostly plant-based. You'll see that uh, a lot of the foods on here are very similar to what's on the um, Mediterranean diet. It includes a lot of whole, unprocessed foods. Um, the difference here is that it prescribes specific servings. So for example, a person on the DASH diet uh, may have to have eight to 10 servings of uh, fruits and vegetables per day. Uh, and it's, there's a description of what a serving uh, would look like. 
So uh, in some versions of the uh, DASH diet, there's a limit on sodium to 1500 milligrams. In some versions, there's, uh, it's just the regular uh, limit of 23 milligrams uh, of sodium per day. Uh, but regardless, uh, they both tend to lower uh, blood pressure. The one that's 1500 milligrams does tend to lower it a bit more. Now, addition, in addition to lowering blood pressure, the DASH diet, uh, similar to the Mediterranean diet, can lower uh, bad cholesterol, that LDL cholesterol, and can help stabilize and manage blood sugar as well, and can ultimately reduce the risk of chronic diseases like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, gout, and kidney disease. So our next diets are uh, vegetarian and vegan diets. So these are obviously plant-based diets. Uh, vegetarian diets may include uh, some dairy. They may include eggs as well. Uh, vegan diets are entirely plant-based and include no animal products at all. Uh, they are rich in nutrients, of course, assuming that we're including those whole foods and we're not going for processed vegetarian and vegan foods. Um, I will note that with vegan diets, there is a risk if you don't do it properly that you might miss some nutrients uh, like protein, calcium, vitamin B12, and iron. So if this is something that you're considering um, following, make sure to consult with, with a dietitian or a uh, view the resources that we have at the end of uh, our presentation here, you can find some information on how to properly follow a vegan diet uh, on some of those links there. Uh, so both vegan and vegetarian diets tend to help in lowering LDL cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, and inflammation, and ultimately can reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, and some uh, cancers, specifically uh, colon cancer and breast cancer. Our next diet is the portfolio diet. Uh, now the portfolio diet is actually a Toronto discovery. It was developed by Dr. Jenkins and colleagues at St. Michael's Hospital. So the reason it's called the portfolio diet is that it's a plant-based or vegetarian diet uh, that include a portfolio of cholesterol lowering foods. So these foods include nuts, so that would be 45 grams uh, daily. Viscous fiber, so this is the type of fiber that you would get from oats, you would get from okra, uh, you might get uh, from beans, chickpeas, lentils, so 20 grams of that is recommended daily. Um, plant sterols are recommended as well, so 2 grams daily of plant sterols. Uh, plant sterols are substances we find in plant foods that are similar in structure to cholesterol in the body. So they compete for absorption and that helps lower our LDL cholesterol. Now, if we were just to, if we were to try to get plant sterols from our diet, uh, it wouldn't add up to two grams. So that's why we need to have uh, our plant sterols from fortified foods like fortified margarine or fortified um, yogurts. Um, the last food on there is the uh, is plant protein. So 50 uh, grams of plant protein are recommended per day. So this could come from your nuts and seeds, beans, chickpeas, lentils, and soy protein as well. So think tofu, tempeh, um, edamame, all great, uh, soy milk as well, all great sources of that uh, plant protein. Uh, now each of these uh, groups of foods will... Uh, lower cholesterol by around five to 10% and the effect is additive. So you could start with one, introducing one and then just um, adding, uh, gradually adding the different uh, groups. Um, now they tend to lower this pattern. Of course, it's designed to lower cholesterol, but it's also been found to lower blood pressure, uh, sh blood sugar and inflammation, and ultimately, uh, just like the other patterns, can reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, uh, and diabetes. So what do all of these patterns have in common? Uh, they all include whole foods that come from plants. So really, the key to preventing chronic disease seems to be to include more plants in our diet. Now, I've just presented a ton of evidence for different um, dietary patterns. Uh, which one is right for us? Uh, how do we choose? 
one simple way to integrate all of that uh, evidence and think of it practically is to follow the Canada's Food Guide uh, because the Canada's Food Guide was developed with all of this evidence uh, in mind as well as with uh, by consulting experts uh, in the field. So what the Food Guide recommends is that our plate looks like this where half of our plate uh, includes our fruits and vegetables, a quarter of our plate has whole grains, and a quarter of our plate is where we find our protein. Now in, in the protein section you could be getting your animal proteins like your lean uh, meats, lean chicken, fish, eggs, uh, but you could also be getting your um, plant protein which is what we uh, recommend that you eat uh, more often. So things like your beans, chickpeas, lentils, nuts and seeds, uh, soy protein, and all of those that we've uh, mentioned. And the main uh, beverage of choice uh, is water. Now the food guide not just talks, uh, doesn't just talk about what we should eat, but also focuses on how we should eat. Uh, so Behaviors like being mindful of your eating habits, cooking at home more often, enjoying your food, and eating your meals with others can also be really important when it comes to healthy eating. And also with um, grocery shopping, just making sure that we're looking at food labels, we're trying to limit how much of those highly processed uh, foods that we have, and being aware of how food marketing works as well. So that's all, um, everything I've mentioned so far is grounded in solid evidence. Lots of studies have been done uh, on these dietary patterns and we know uh, with some confidence that they do work. Um, now we also have trends that come and go, some of them stay, some of them don't, uh, but we always need evidence to start to recommend uh, certain diets uh, to the general public. Uh, so the trends that I've seen this year have been the fasting diet, the ketogenic diet, and more recently I've hearing, been hearing a bit of buzz about the carnivore diet. So the intermittent fasting diet, which has been popular, uh, popularized by Dr. Jason Fung, involves some sort of fasting. There are different types, some more restrictive than others. You have you know, the 16-8, which is 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of where you can eat. There's the 5-2, which is five days of normal eating, two days of uh, very low calorie uh, eating or fasting, and then we have alternate day fasting as well. Uh, now the idea behind fasting is that it would, um, it mimics how our, the meal patterns of our ancestors, where there were periods of feast and famine, uh, and that uh, with, by fasting, we're actually eating uh, in a way that we have evolved to eat and it would be ideal for our metabolism. Uh, so some of the claims around intermittent fasting is that it can uh, improve our metabolism, it can lead to weight loss, and it can lead to better blood sugar management as well, specifically in people with diabetes. Uh, we do find some of these um, results in studies where we do see some weight loss, some um, Blood, improved blood sugar control, um, and in both animal and human studies, some changes to the metabolism. Uh, but it is important to note that most of these studies have been, um, they have small, smaller sample sizes. They've been done uh, over usually a period of 12 months, maybe 24 months. But we don't have any longer term studies to see whether these effects um, are sustained over the long term, whether people are able to sustain this habit in the long term, um, and whether it's even different from just following the, something like the Mediterranean diet, does it give us any added benefit? Uh, the next one is the ketogenic diet, and this is a, a very high fat, very low carb diet uh, that puts our body into a state of ketosis where we're using uh, fat as our main source of energy instead of carbohydrates, which is usually what we uh, tend to use. Um, now, with that comes the research has shown that, yes, it leads to weight loss. It, does, it can lead to um, 
better blood sugar control than people with diabetes. Uh, but it may not be safe for everyone, of course, especially people who are on medications. It's quite a restrictive diet, so it can be challenging to stay on. Uh, and we even see this in the research where there's a lot of uh, dropout rates. Uh, and we also don't know the long-term risks of cutting out all these carbohydrate-rich foods, which are actually can be quite healthy, like for example, whole grains beans, chickpeas, lentils. We don't know what happens when we cut these out for a long period of time. So we still need to understand um, these long-term effects better. The next one is uh, the carnivore diet. And I've been hearing a bit of buzz about this over the past uh, few months. It's been around for a while though. Um, now the idea behind the carnivore diet is that we don't need to be eating any plant foods, that they are toxic for us, and we should only be eating meat. Um, so some people will eat just red meat, some would include uh, both red meat um, and other types of meat. So um, this diet, there isn't much research on it. And also we just discussed how important plant foods are uh, for our health. So I would uh, be a bit cautious when it comes to this one. Um, it's just not supported by the evidence. So ultimately, a healthy eating pattern is one that is evidence-based, enjoyable, and easy to sustain in the long term. Uh, thank you for listening. I will pass this on to Carly, who will then take all of this information and uh, turn it into practical tips that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Terrific. Well, thank you, Nilu. That was an outstanding tour through uh, some of the evidence around what healthy eating really means. Uh, transitioning over to our next topic, uh, we have the privilege of introducing Carly uh, Falaise. Oh, she is a registered dietitian with Loblaws. You could find her in the stores at Maple Leaf Gardens or Young in Eglinton. Uh, she's been working there for a number of years and enjoys uh, meeting clients in the store, providing nutrition education. Uh, Carly, thanks for joining us and providing this tour through Practical Tips for Healthy Eating. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. And I'm excited to talk more about uh, the practical tips for healthy eating. So taking uh, the reasons um, we le learned a little bit about why it's so important to eat healthy. And then we learned a little bit about the dietary patterns on healthy eating. So I'm going to be talking about how to get started and how to kind of put it into practice. So first I'll be chatting a little bit about meal planning basics as well as uh, healthy meal and snack ideas to give you some creative inspiration. And then I'm also gonna to touch on mindful eating, which tends to be a hot topic as well right now, and how to enjoy your food more. So I'm just ready for the next slide. So first of all, when we talk meal planning basics, ideally we kind of wanna plan for at least three meals a day. So we wanna have that breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner, just to make sure that we're getting the energy that we need throughout the day and to prevent us from feeling really, really hungry. Um, ideally, spacing meals about four to six hours apart. Um, also listening to your hunger and fullness cues here, but that's generally when we physically start to feel hungry for our next uh, meal. And again, just avoiding skipping meals um, as it prevents us from feeling extremely hungry. Uh, when we do feel this extreme hunger, that's when we tend to make maybe quick food choices. We go for convenience takeout foods and we may end up actually overeating because we're so hungry. It's harder for us to listen to our hunger and fullness signals at that time. We also want to base our meals off the balanced plate. So Nilu did a great presentation on Canada's food guide. So I've got a picture here for you to see. Um, so ideally kind of basing your meals off, off of this. So having half a plate of vegetable, quarter plate of grain or starch, and another quarter plate of, of, of protein. Uh, snacks are also really important in our day today. I highly encourage you to listen to your hunger cues. So let that really be your guide, whether uh, you know, snack is, is needed or not. Um, it's important to inc include a source of fiber and protein. Both of these foods help to keep us feeling full longer. Uh, so it's going to make for a little bit more satisfying snack. And I also encourage people to plan for at least one snack a day, but by all means have more, again, listening to your hunger and fullness there. Next slide. 
So also, I, I like to kind of um, talk about meal planning and, and steps here. So step one, we want to plan. We want to set aside 10 to 30 minutes, at least once a week, to brainstorm meal ideas. Uh, I encourage you to check your fridge, freezer, cupboards, just to see what you have. Maybe you can base some meals around what you already have at home. Uh, I encourage you to check flyers for sale items and to make a shopping list before going to the store. It definitely helps you stay on track uh, once you get to the grocery store. And I encourage you to aim for meal balance. So again, following that Canada's food guide and then get inspired and, and be creative. Uh, find uh, different maybe people to follow on Instagram, uh, watch different YouTube videos, get some inspiration to just kind of create uh, fun meals and, and make it exciting for you and, and more enjoyable that way. I also recommend keeping a recipe binder for your favorite go-to meal ideas or maybe a folder on your computer. So that way, once you've kind of built a bit of a library, it's, it's easy to go back through and say, oh yeah, I love that meal. That's what I'm feeling this week. And it'll ultimately make it a little bit easier for you uh, on a weekly basis down the road. Uh, step two is to prepare. So I highly recommend packing lunches the night before and making multiple if you can. Uh, batch cooking is definitely the way to go here. Um, so plan for extras when you're making dinner and maybe use those leftovers for lunch the next day. Um, and don't forget to also have uh, a couple healthy grab and go snacks planned and, and ready to go in the fridge as well. Um, one tip that I like to give my clients is to, if you tend to grocery shop on the weekends, maybe on a Sunday, when you get home from the grocery store, you're kind of already in the mode of, of grocery shopping. You know, you have your meal ideas in mind for the week. I encourage you to do a little bit of meal prep at that time, and then maybe even do enough meal prep to get you through the first half of the week up until Wednesday, and then maybe Wednesday, um, do a little bit more meal prep to get you through to the end of the week. Um, and that way you're really only doing two main um, kind of batch cooking each week. So I find that tends to be really helpful for a lot of people. And then step three, to eat and to enjoy your meal and to just take that moment. I know it can be hard, um, but just to kind of take that moment away from work and just enjoy your meal. Um, and, you know, you put all that good time and effort into it. So it's definitely important to make sure that you take the time to sit and enjoy it too. So perfect. So right now, um, we may be spending a little bit more time at home. Um, and I think what's really important is to get the whole family involved in cooking. It's a great opportunity to teach your kids life skills um, that are going to be so important for them down the road uh, when they move out and live on their own, or even when they get a little bit older and to help out more around the house with uh, cooking meals. So I really encourage everyone to pick recipes together as a family. Um, meal plan and make a grocery list together, including a few foods that everybody in the family enjoys. Um, younger children can actually help with stirring, pouring, squeezing a lemon, mashing potatoes, and peeling hard-boiled eggs. And a little bit older children, so children as old as eight years, can actually write a grocery list on their own, um, prepare simple breakfasts and lunches, and use simple kitchen equipment like a can opener um, after being shown how to use safely. Um, so I think it's just really great to just start to encourage um, kids getting involved in the kitchen at a very young age and make it fun and creative um, and just enjoy the moments together that you have. They'll definitely make lots of great memories in the future. All right. So what's also important to keep in mind are the tools that are available to make healthy food choices. So the Nutrition Facts label uh, is an excellent tool uh, to help guide you to more nutritious choices when you're in the grocery store. Um, the number one thing that I recommend looking at is the um, serving size. So that's the first thing that we want to look at on the Nutrition Facts table. Um, everything below that, uh, you know, you're either going to, if you're going to eat more than that serving, you might have to double it. Maybe you're going to eat less than that serving, then you can divide it. Um, but it really helps to determine how much um, of everything is in that, in that food. So the second thing that's most important to look at is the percent daily value. And this basically tells you whether a food has a lot or a little bit of a nutrient. 
So any food that is 5% or less has a little, and anything that's 15% or more means it has a lot. So for something like sodium um, or sugar, we tend to want to see a little bit less of those foods. And for anything that um, like fiber, calcium, iron, we might want to see a little bit more. So we're looking for the 15% or more for those foods. All right, we're ready for the next slide. Awesome. So now I'm just going to try to um, inspire everybody with some different breakfast, lunch, and dinner ideas. So I like to say that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It just kind of helps to get you started. It helps to improve your performance and attention over the day, and it also reduces hunger later in the day. I usually recommend having a breakfast within one to two hours of waking up in the morning. Um, healthy breakfast ideas include a smoothie, so you can include Greek yogurt, maybe some frozen fruit, um, some kale or spinach, and a nut or seed butter to add a little bit of extra protein. Um, so that definitely makes for a nice meal. Um, and I also encourage maybe having a slice of toast or two with it um, as well, just to add a little bit more. Um, I love wraps for breakfast. So a breakfast wrap with scrambled eggs, a little bit of spinach, mushrooms, and some cheese to add a little bit of extra protein there and calcium uh, also makes for a great grab and go breakfast idea. Uh, overnight oats is actually one of my all time favorites. So it's something that you can actually prepare ahead of time the night before and you add oats, milk, yogurt together. I also like to add uh, some chia seeds or flax seeds as well. I find it helps to thicken it a little bit. Leave it in the fridge overnight, let it set. And then the next morning it's ready to eat. You can actually microwave it or you can eat it cold and add a little bit of fruit and maybe some more nuts or seeds to it. Um, a cereal is also another like really quick option. I just recommend going for a higher fiber option and I'll be going over how to actually choose a healthy cereal in a, flute in a few slides. Um, but also incorporating maybe some milk or milk alternative, nuts and fruit as well, just to make it a little bit more, it's gonna be a little bit more satisfying meal that way. I also love toast for breakfast. Um, so just some fun ideas would be to add different nut or seed butters, um, like sunflower seed butter, or almond butter. Um, cottage cheese is another one that I love on toast. I do a little bit of like a low sugar jam and add some cottage cheese on top. Cottage cheese is really high in protein, pretty equivalent to Greek yogurt. So it's a really good one that's going to stick with you for the day or the morning. Um, ricotta cheese is another nice one. I like adding a tiny touch of vanilla to my ricotta cheese and then chop a little bit of fresh basil and put some fresh blueberries on top. And I find that that's a very easy gourmet type breakfast. Um, and then also, I don't think anything's better than a little bit of mashed avocado on toast. And then you want to still add a little bit of protein for that satiety. So maybe a boiled egg or some tempeh. Awesome. And then for lunch, um, I really encourage using leftovers for lunch. So if you made a little bit of extra for dinner the night before, definitely add that uh, into your lunch the next day. Making multiple lunches, so batch cooking, I find really, really helpful. Um, bulk cooking, if you're doing like a large soup, stew, or chili. Um, bringing a lunch definitely saves time, money, and nutrition. So I've actually added pictures of different lunches I've made for myself <laughs> that I really liked. Uh, so I just wanted to share those with everyone today. Um, but the healthy lunch ideas that I have, uh, one that I absolutely love is a green bowl. And I find that it lasts uh, really well in the morning. So it's something that you can put all together. You can add your dressing and it's going to be good to go for lunch. Um, but doing something like a brown rice or quinoa, adding some chopped vegetables for lots of color and texture, adding some beans for some protein, and then um, avocado for that extra flavor and healthy fat. Um, I do a very similar thing with salad, and I like to call it a meal salad, where you're still incorporating all parts of the plate. So you're starting with a uh, base of a leafy green, you're adding um, still a grain or a starch. So sometimes I actually add brown rice or quinoa. I like roasting sweet potatoes or the little mini potatoes um, to add to salads. I like to add different proteins. So maybe some canned salmon, a boiled egg, or um, some chickpeas. And then I also like to add lots of different vegetables like peppers, tomatoes, zucchini. And then what I like to call flavor enhancers, which would be like your nuts and seeds, your avocado, that are just gonna add a little bit more dimension to your salad. So instead of just having lettuce, um, a salad like that is definitely more of a meal um, comprising of all parts of the plate. Another quick uh, lunch idea could be a vegetable and bean soup. 
whole grain crackers and fruit, um, a chicken wrap made with maybe some uh, leftover chicken from the night before, adding a side salad and yogurt, and then some different sandwich ideas. So I know sandwiches, you kind of maybe think, oh, like they're a little boring, but it's, it, you can make them fun and interesting and change it up on a regular basis. So one of my favorites is actually to do mashed chickpeas. So I use a potato masher, I mash the chickpeas, and I add a little bit of tzatziki dip, fresh lemon juice and fresh dill chopped into it. And I absolutely love that as a healthy sandwich filler. Um, also egg salad is a quick one, salmon salad, Again, that chicken, uh, maybe thinly sliced uh, from dinner the night before. And then also homemade veggie burgers that you could make up ahead of time. You can freeze and then use as like a nice sandwich filler for later in the week. All right. And then also some different dinner ideas. So I find dinner is definitely a time that I like to encourage eating together as a family. Um, also planning ahead for dinners is really helpful, especially if you have a busy week ahead with work or school. Um, and then also just getting the whole family involved when it comes to prepping uh, dinner. So some different ideas that I have are doing a roast chicken uh, and actually adding the carrots, parsnips and sweet potato just around the side of the roast chicken and uh, cooking it all together. Um, very like time saving and easy that way. Everything's just kind of getting cooked at once. Uh, fish is one of my all time favorite quick weeknight meals. So maybe doing something like salmon, uh, brown rice, steamed green beans. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, just pretty simple for salmon. I love just adding a little bit of squeezed uh, fresh lemon and then a touch of black pepper um, just to add a little bit of flavor that way. Uh, tofu pasta is a really fun one that I love doing and I think it would be a hit with a lot of kids too. Um, so stir fried tofu, adding some stir fried crumbled cauliflower, grated carrot, and then adding a tomato sauce. Um, I usually go for a little bit lower sodium tomato sauce, but then add in some fresh flavors with some dried oregano or um, basil and really make it my own that way and some fresh garlic. And then doing a whole grain pasta and just topping it all off with a little bit of Parmesan. Uh, one of my other favorite uh, dinners is actually lentil tacos. So uh, just a vegetarian twist. So using lentils with some uh, sauteed peppers and onion, adding some spices like chili powder and cumin, and then filling a uh, soft tortilla with some sh um, your mixture there and some shredded cabbage and avocado. And it's really easy to make a nice crema sauce with plain Greek yogurt. So I actually love keeping a bit of plain Greek yogurt on hand because I do find it's great for making healthy uh, sauces during the weeknight. And then lastly, a chicken stir fry with broccoli, uh, maybe adding some carrot, ginger, garlic, um, making a quick peanut sauce, and then um, doing a soba buckwheat noodle as your grain. I love uh, noodles like that because they're really quick to cook. They only take about three minutes. So something that can just be really easy and quick for, for a weeknight. So I, I wanted to touch on different ways that we can use frozen vegetables in case um, currently we don't have a lot of access to fresh uh, produce. So frozen vegetables are just as nutritious as fresh and convenient to have on hand since they have a long shelf life. A few different ways to use them could be uh, making fried rice, so adding frozen peas, carrots, and corn. Uh, you can add frozen vegetables to smoothies, so maybe doing like a frozen kale or spinach. And I find that frozen fruit and vegetables go the best in smoothies because it makes them nice and cold and gives them like a really thick texture, and then you don't have to add extra ice. Um, I also love adding frozen vegetables to soups. So kale, spinach, mixed vegetables all go really, really well in soup. Um, adding uh, frozen veggies to stir fry. So maybe doing a cook, uh, cook a bag of mixed vegetables and add then your protein and your sauce. So it can be really easy that way. Um, and then also you can add frozen vegetables to convenient items. So if you've stocked up a little bit on some of these convenience items, um, for example, like sidekicks noodles, you can actually add to those by adding uh, frozen vegetables, add some frozen edamame or canned beans, and then you're just creating a little bit more balanced meal. Um, so just some different ideas on what to do if you have stocked up on your frozen fruits and vegetables right now. So just a few other items that I thought uh, are good to keep in your pantry right now in light of COVID-19, but also just all year round. Uh, canned tomatoes are great. You can add them into chilies, soups, stews, 
Uh, you can make a homemade butter chicken, pasta sauces, and homemade gravy for roasts. Uh, beans and lentils, again, excellent plant-based protein. I love adding them into soups, salads, wraps. I love roasting them as a snack, um, incorporating them as part of like a dip and mixed into meat-based dishes, um, like a chili or maybe a shepherd's pie. Um, and canned fish is another excellent one to stock up on. Uh, you can use them in salads, wraps, macaroni and cheese, tuna melts, fish cakes, and salmon dips. So these are definitely some pantry uh, items that I think would be great to keep on hand all the time. So last but not least, um, our healthy snacks are also an important component of our day. Um, it can just give us a little bit more energy when we kind of feel that afternoon slump coming on, maybe around three or four o'clock. And I find having a healthy snack that's planned and ready to go is really, really important because it can give us the energy we need to actually make a healthy dinner that night too. Um, so choose foods that will nourish your body. Um, pay attention to your hunger when uh, you're snacking. So make sure you know you've, you're physically hungry. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few slides too. Um, and again, including that source of protein and fiber. So just some different ideas here. Uh, unsalted trail mix, uh, maybe some mini pita, hummus, veggie sticks, apple and cheese, um, banana and peanut butter, a high fiber granola bar, homemade energy bites. That's actually a picture of some energy bites that I made a few weeks ago. Um, they were delicious and you can actually freeze them and, and take them out. So I love making them in a large batch. Uh, and then I've got them for snacks for a little while. Um, also roasted chickpeas are an excellent snack. They're kind of like a two in one, some protein and fiber all in one there. Edamame, I love doing as a snack too. And I actually just use the frozen edamame. I quickly microwave it and then it's good to go. Um, and then also like yogurt and fruit. So uh, yogurt cups or those little cottage cheese cups can be really handy to keep on hand for snacks too. So um, when it comes to healthy snacking or healthy breakfast, I, I love um, providing this 484 guide. Um, so really what we're, what we're doing is uh, helping you choose a healthy granola bar or cereal. So you want to look at the nutrition facts table and my guide is usually looking for at least four grams or more of fiber. Uh, we want to see less than eight grams of sugar and four or more grams of protein. So this is an excellent guide that I like using um, for those types of foods. And I find it just, it makes, it takes all the confusion out of it. Um, so just when you're kind of in that uh, grocery aisle with cereals and granola bars, definitely use this guide to help you choose a, a healthier option. So now I'm gonna chat a little bit more about mindful eating. So I've, I've got a quote here, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So that's a quote from John Kabat-Zinn, who is a researcher in mindfulness training um, for uh, chronic health conditions. And so mindful eating, we're really thinking about um, being in the here and now of eating, listening to our bodies, and focusing on our, our hunger and fullness signals. Uh, it's a non-judgmental approach to food and really focuses on being in that present moment and placing no restrictions on food. So really every food has its place in our diet, um, and mindful eating can help us eat some of those um, more fun foods uh, in a way that's going to still be uh, maintaining a, a healthy relationship with our, with our food and our bodies. So um, one thing that I like to do or encourage uh, when it comes to mindful eating is recognizing our hunger cues. So just taking that moment before eating an unplanned meal or snack and asking yourself, am I hungry? So if you, if you are and you're getting those physical sensations that you're hungry, yes, by all means, please eat. Uh, you need to have a snack or meal. Um, if you're not really sure if you're hungry or not, then kind of thinking a little bit further, what might be going on? Um, are you following a rule when it comes to eating? Uh, is there an emotion that you're maybe experiencing? Are you stressed? Are you bored? Are you anxious? Um, or are you just kind of having that craving for something that's like salty or sweet? Um, 
sometimes if you're not totally sure if you're uh, physically hungry or maybe um, experiencing something like an emotional or, or maybe a food craving uh, type of hunger, I suggest uh, thinking of an apple and asking yourself, am I hungry enough right now to eat this apple? And if you say, yes, I'm like really hungry, I need this apple, I need more than this apple, then you're, you're likely physically hungry. If you kind of think, hmm, I'm not really in the mood for this apple, I think I'm, I'm feeling more so like this bag of chips or this chocolate, um, then you might not actually be physically hungry. So just by taking this pause and asking yourself before you eat, you know, what type of hunger am I experiencing? It's just making you a little bit more aware of your current feelings and situation. And it just helps to put a little bit more, um, just put you a little bit more in control of, of that situation and how you want to move forward. So another tool that I really love using uh, is the hunger and fullness scale. So at one end of this scale, you know, uh, at number one, we are just ravenous, we're starving, um, we're probably lightheaded, we're feeling faint, um, we're not feeling well, we probably feel sick. And on the other end of the spectrum, at our 10 here, you know, we are Thanksgiving Day stuffed. Um, we have uh, just eaten to the point where we can't get off the couch. We just feel sick as well. So at both ends of the spectrum, we physically don't feel well. So what I'm encouraging is to kind of stay in, in that middle area. Um, so when we kind of reach uh, like a number four, uh, when we're experiencing some hunger pangs, that can be a good indication that we need a snack or maybe a meal if, if uh, our next, uh, if we won't be able to eat for the next little while. Definitely when we're feeling hungry at that three, uh, we need to make sure that we're having a meal at that time. Uh, on the flip side, we also want to make sure that we are paying attention while we're eating and making sure that we, we stop eating when we start to feel satisfied and when we feel full. And I think that this is really important. Um, and it's something that I encourage uh, you to kind of think of maybe before you eat and then also while you're eating, just to kind of be a little bit more mindful in that moment. So some benefits of mindful eating. So we might have less feelings of deprivation and be satisfied with less food. We might make healthier food choices and actually enjoy eating more and accept ourselves by moving away from judgmental thoughts. So those two were just a couple strategies uh, that I had, but there's a lot more um, mindful eating strategies out there. So it's definitely something that I encourage uh, people to look into. And I really do think it's a great movement and a great way to kind of foster a healthy relationship with your food. So just an overview now. Um, so I, re I really encourage to set small goals for yourself. We covered a lot of different information today. And I think just to kind of get things started, maybe pick one goal and it could be, for example, maybe um, prepping meal prepping breakfast uh, for a work week. Or maybe if that's kind of seeming like a lot for you, maybe even just prepping a breakfast two days during the week. So just showing that it can be adaptable and really, really personalized based on you. Um, also, it's important to start with planning ahead, shopping and prepping foods at home, get the whole family involved, um, follow the balanced plate, eat regularly throughout the day, and become a mindful eater. So um, lastly here, we've got uh, just a slide. This is just showcasing um, an online booking portal for the Loblaws dietitians. So we actually have a team of us across Canada, which is really exciting. Um, and we do offer one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling. Uh, we normally offer our nutrition counseling in the store, but right now in light of COVID-19, we are offering phone consultations. So if you are interested in seeing a dietitian, I highly recommend checking out our site and you can actually um, log in and see where uh, the closest dietitian is to you and you can book right online. And here we have a, a slide just on different resources. So um, the first one here, Unlock Food, is a great resource with lots of different nutrition information. 
Um, I highly recommend going there if you have kind of like a few questions about healthy eating. There's tons of different topics and recipe ideas. Um, the next one is called Cookspiration and that's through Dietitians of Canada and it's uh, a resource with all different uh, recipes and snack ideas and I find they're quite simple and all nutritious. So I really recommend going there. I usually recommend that uh, link to clients um, in my practice. And then we also have the links for Cardio College and Diabetes College for more information on uh, healthy eating for heart health and diabetes. Um, dietitians.ca is the Dietitians of Canada website. Um, and then the next one is for Canada's Food Guide if you want to have a copy to save for yourself at home. And then the last one here is our Loblaws uh, Dietitian page. So we do actually have a page with uh, different recipe ideas and some tips from our dietitians. So I also recommend checking that out as well. But uh, without further ado, that was all uh, from me today. So thank you so much. And I hope you learned uh, lots of new and innovative ideas when it comes to meal ideas and uh, meal prepping at home. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Carly. That was outstanding. And I, I think we've, uh, our, our plates are full, maybe, uh, but certainly our minds are full and we're inspired to uh, jump into one of those uh, yummy meals that uh, you photoed for us. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so for, for questions. And I know that there are many uh, points of interest from the audience. Um, let me uh, start off with a couple of, of uh, like uh, quick hits. Um, uh, Carly, um, can you provide some advice about food safety, washing, handling of products, especially in, in this current COVID climate? Yeah, I would recommend um, when you take your groceries home from the store, um, I would just make sure like you can put them away. Um, but then I would just uh, wipe the surface of the counter where you put your groceries um, just to clean that. Um, and then when it comes to actually like using your produce, um, I would just make sure that you're rinsing it well with a clean scrub brush under uh, cool running water and just make sure you're giving it a really, really good rinse. Um, before meal prepping, you just really want to make sure that you wash your hands well, so for at least 20 seconds. And then also I encourage um, after meal prepping and after eating your meal to also wash your hands well again. And I think that's um, just important. So just kind of following regular um, food uh, safety practices here. And if you're cooking meat, just make sure that you're cooking it to the proper uh, internal temperature. Uh, fabulous. Thanks, Carly. I, I, I know uh, working with a number of dietitians over the years, they've always got great advice in all times to handle food safely. And I think we're just enhancing that uh, 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 much more in, in this current climate. Uh, Nilu, there's, there's a few questions around nutrition and the brain, uh, kind of brain and cognitive uh, benefits, as well as uh, maybe mood related to nutrition. I wonder if you might have some comments about that. Sure. Uh, so when it comes to brain health and cognition and prevention of uh, dementia, studies have been done on a few dietary patterns. So we know uh, that the Mediterranean style uh, of eating uh, can uh, prevent cognitive impairment. Uh, also, if you look at uh, studies that look at brain imaging, um, you find that people who follow the uh, a Mediterranean style uh, way of eating, uh, they show less of those early signs of uh, dementia uh, in the in brain images. Uh, now, Mediterranean diet is one uh, of the patterns that could be uh, useful. There's another that's called uh, the mind diet, which is a combination uh, of the Mediterranean diet um, and the DASH diet. And again, that also uh, has, uh, there's evidence that it can help with things like the cognitive uh, preventing or delaying cognitive impairment uh, and dementia. And uh, a research group at Baycrest has actually developed what they call a brain health food guide. Uh, so it's based on the Mediterranean diet and they've also looked into specific foods that might help with uh, preventing dementia. So um, in addition to just following a, a standard Mediterranean diet, there's specific emphasis on things like leafy greens, uh, walnuts, berries, uh, fatty fish, like your salmon, uh, your 
sardines your mackerel uh, and that it's it's published online so if you just google brain health food guide uh, baycrest that will come up and i know uh, some of the research is actually being conducted uh, at the cardiac rehab uh, program at tri um, now when it comes to mood again a similar sort of uh, eating pattern is recommended for things like diet uh, depression um, and anxiety. So again, a lot of those whole plant-based uh, foods, less of the processed foods that are high in sugar, high in salt, and also things like caffeine and alcohol might play a role uh, when it comes to things like mood and depression. So uh, limiting those and just watching out for symptoms um, as well. Thanks, Nilu. Uh, Carly, in the rapid round, um, if you can't get fresh produce, what's your advice about, I think you did talk about frozen, canned foods. Um, how do we balance those things out? And is that a, still a healthy approach? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, canned and frozen uh, are excellent options. Um, I like to say they're just as nutritious as fresh. Um, but the important thing is, is just making sure that you're choosing canned and frozen that don't have uh, any salt added. Um, sometimes you can find like frozen vegetables that are prepared with other um, kind of flavor enhancers too, like extra salt and butter. So I just recommend choosing um, the plain options uh, that don't have anything added um, that are like more so if you're choosing, uh, choosing something that's canned, something that's packed in water uh, is going to be a really nutritious option too. And I think it's great for times like this when, you know, maybe um, we don't want to leave the house as often, or maybe we can't leave the house and, um, you know, our canned and frozen are way more, you know, shelf stable, and they're going to last a lot longer. So they're going to be excellent options right now. And as I had mentioned, like you can use them in so many different ways. Um, so roasting, adding to sauces, soups, um, adding to casseroles, lasagnas. So there's pretty much any way that you would use fresh, you can almost use canned or frozen as well. Great. Thanks, Carly. Uh, from the online questions, there's an overall theme uh, around food, and this is going to be for both of you because it might be a slightly longer answer. Um, it seems that there are very knowledgeable people online and, and people have made uh, good choices around their food patterns based upon what they've seen, what they've read, their own uh, interpretations of the literature, which is great. But, but it's interesting when you ask a lot of people that there are very uh, kind of, a, of uh, divergent caps that, that emerge. And some people online are really advocating for a vegetarian vegan approaches to, to diets. Others are at the other end uh, advocating for high fat, low carb uh, sorts, of, sorts of approaches. And um, part of the underlying part is also around perhaps changing views on, on risks or benefits of cholesterol and sugar and salt in our diets. I, I wonder if you, if you might, Anilu, start this off about, you know, is there a single pattern that, that's, the, quote, the best? Um, or is there kind of room for all, depending on who you are? Yeah, so... Um... Ultimately, it's always up to the individual. So it's up to the individual to do their research, uh, to uh, make their choice as to which dietary pattern uh, works for them. Uh, there is no one size fits all. So you really have to look at your needs, uh, your preferences, your beliefs, your values, uh, and the evidence that's out there and combine all this information and make, uh, make a decision uh, that works for you. And of course, when it comes to things like your health, of course, regular health uh, checkups will, it, it can help you tell if the diet that you're on is working for you. And that can also be, uh, so for example, if you go, you're following a certain pattern and you find, you know, your blood pressure has gone up uh, or that has, it has gone down, you can, you can tell those, um, you know, whether that diet has had a positive or a negative impact on your health. So um, everybody knows themselves best. We're here to just present uh, the evidence and the choice is ultimately up to the individual. That, that's great. Thank you, Nilu. And, and Carly, uh, you know, it's kind of building on your comment that I, that I wrote down uh, and I'll put this on a bumper uh, sticker maybe. Every food has a place in our diet. Um, so, so folks who um, might be advocating for high uh, animal protein diets versus 
uh, and low carb versus those that would do uh, the kind of the high plant, high carb uh, sorts of approaches. Uh, how do you approach that question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Nilu actually had like an excellent answer. Um, it really does come down to the individual. I think it's important to take, um, you know, your, your current health status into account um, and like, and, and just how, how easy is it going to be for you? Is it, is it going to make your life, you know, really, really difficult to follow uh, like a very specific diet? Or, you know, do you feel like you'll be able to, to follow it a little bit easier? Um, but I think that overall, um, what we can do is just provide you with the information of what we know now and, and you know, weighing the, the pros and the cons. And then it really is up to the individual on whether they would like to uh, move forward with a particular diet like that. Um, and kind of moving along with like the, the every food has its place. Um, you know, eating doesn't have to be black and white, you know, there's lots of gray. And I think uh, we're, you know, we're, we're very, you know, this is good, or this is bad. I think that there's a lot of different foods that can have a place in our diets. And it's just becoming okay with that gray and, and maybe not feeling so, so strict that we need to follow a particular diet or that we need to to eat these foods or not these foods. Um, I think it can really benefit our, our health and our relationship with food if, if we don't focus so much on uh, what we can and can't have, but, but just kind of focusing overall on, on a healthy diet, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, thanks to both of you. And you know, there's many more questions that we can uh, get into. And I think what I'll commit to on behalf of uh, of Nilu and Carly is uh, to uh, endeavor to address uh, some of the extra questions uh, through written documents that will be posted later on uh, a along with uh, a version of this presentation. Uh, we've used up their time. This has been a, a, an incredibly um, uh, enthusiastic group and uh, it was a terrific session. So thank you to Nilu and Carly for delivering such an informative um, uh, webinar today, and I hope that everyone did enjoy it. Uh, we all got some important takeaways that will help us to make some healthy lifestyle choices uh, to uh, inform our days and years as we get older, and, and hopefully we'll be able to prevent and or manage the many illnesses and diseases that will come along the way. For those who would like to view this session again at a later time or share it with others, we will be providing you with a link to the recording in the coming week and endeavor to answer those questions. Um, we'd invite you to join us for our next wellness webinar that will be happening on Wednesday, May the 27th, and we'll pick up on the theme of health behaviors and talk about exercise that day in, in a session called it, It's Your Move, uh, small changes to get you moving more. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors who made this uh, series of webinars possible. Thank you to Nilu and Carly for providing some wonderful information and for all of you who joined today's webinar. We wish you good health and, and uh, hope you all stay well uh, in these times and look forward to connecting again. Thank you.